Call the Sims Board of Education, February 27th, 2018 meeting. Glad you're all here. We have some nice faces in the audience. Thank you. Um, anyone have anything they'd like to say? Public audience is available now. Okay. Um, we'll go on to committee um, and board administration communications with Isabel Dorman. All right. Hi, everyone. At Central School, students celebrated Kindness Week oh, this week. <laughs> Make yourself Perfect. Mm -hmm. Each day, members of the Student Council asked students to demonstrate an act of kindness. Some of the days that were celebrated were Compliments Day, Checklist of Kind Things to Do and Say Day, Be Kind to Teachers Day, and Caught Being Kind Day. For students at Latimer Lane, Friday, March 2nd is one of the most anticipated days of the year, bingo night. The event is a fantastic community celebration that runs from 6.30 to 8, and the school is expect expecting a large crowd of people to attend. Great. This Thursday, Simsbury High School's Unified Theater will be hosting its annual performance at 5 o'clock. This year's theme is the time of our lives. Bring family and friends, you won't want to miss this year's show. And as a member of Unified Theater, I can attest to the hard work of each of the performers. And I'm really excited to, and everyone else is excited to present what we have been working on. So please come support. This Friday as well, at the high school from 7.30 to 10.30, the Trojan Wall will be hosting its annual Winter Wonderland Dance, which I'm also really excited about. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Battle of the Bands from this past Friday went amazingly. So congratulations to the five student bands and the staff band, <laughs> <laughs> including last semester's student representative, Dylan Fitch, who was amazing. He mm. got all dressed up in like this space suit and you, he was really into it. And his band, um, Funky Fitch and the Space Whale, won first place. So uh, congrats to all of them again. <laughs> Thank you very much. That, that's a very full report. Simsbury High School seems very busy. Um, Tom? Yes. Jen? No, no, no. I'm good, thanks. Moving on to Ms. Lim. Two things. So on March 14th, Simsbury Public Schools is co-sponsoring with the Connecticut Special Education Parent Teacher Organization, or CEPTO, um, Special Ed Day on Capitol Hill. And uh, we have a number of students that are going to um, come and present the great work that we're doing among uh, members of the greater Simsbury community. And it's just a very positive day of advocacy. So that's going to be held um, from 10 to 12 and welcome any board members to that. You can see me for additional details. And also Community of Care is going to be sponsoring a program that evening uh, at six, six o'clock at the uh, Simsbury Library around the um, concerns of vaping. And we have our SROs that are going to be joining some members of the social services in Simsbury to present on that topic, and certainly all are welcome. What's the date of that one, please? March 14th. And what time is it again? Please? Six o'clock at the Simsbury Public Library Program Room. That's the community of care um, presentation? Yes, it is. Tom. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan? So our last meeting uh, with the board was on February 13th and obviously on the next day on February 14th with the uh, events in Parkland, Florida, the world of schools uh, really shifted and there's been a major focus around safety concerns. Um, and tonight Mr. Curtis has asked me to take just a few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that uh, certainly want to address the issue at Simsbury High School um, from last Thursday and then talk to you just about some of the things that we have um, been paying attention to and refocused on since, since that time. So, uh, you know, not only for you, but hopefully for the people that are watching to put some minds at ease as well. Um, certainly, uh, I think most of you know that last Thursday there was a generalized threat that students had seen on Facebook uh, to uh, 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 act of uh, potential violence to an unnamed SHS, and it was not uh, in any way directly connected to our school, but kids were scared. And most importantly, they came to school and said something to adults. And that was the key um, to us going into action. Um, I got uh, calls almost simultaneously from Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Curtis um, 
and uh, the team at the high school immediately went into action, pulled the emergency team together, and decided to go into um, a modified lockout procedure, which is um, not a lockdown where you go into your classrooms, locks lights out of sight, but a lockdown where you secure the perimeter of the building. And it was the right call, um, and it took uh, a little bit of time into mid-morning until the Simsbury police were able to clear the threat. Um, the cooperation of police the the team at the high school um, really the students and staff was exactly what you would want in reaction to that um, and the communications went quickly uh, and, and really I felt like uh, in, a, in a moment of heightened uh, awareness we did really well um, what I, what I want people to be aware of uh, also are some of the other things that have happened in the last couple of weeks um, we I had talked to you a couple of months ago that we prior to this had hired a consultant to come in and look at two of our schools, Simsbury High School and Squadron Line School, to do full day assessments around security at those schools. I am pleased to say that we just received back his comprehensive reports. So we have a lot of stuff to act upon um, based on his, uh, there's a ton of compliments in there about what we're already doing. Um, and quite frankly, most of his recommendations are not around further hard wiring of the building or doors or locks, and but they're around the way that people can improve their awareness of their surroundings and the way that they're surveilling the building. And so it's probably not so much going to involve costs as much as it is training to, to uh, help adults and kids become more aware uh, and, and we'll be following through on those recommendations from our consultant. The other thing that uh, is going to be in the training mode, we had done a uh, level of training with our administrative council around um, active shooter training. We had done some uh, emergency management um, uh, trainings and also now that we have these recommendations from Don Chomet, um, we are going to be pulling together each of, uh, not, not out to full faculties yet, but we're going to pull, each of our schools has a school safety team, about half a dozen people that are the key um, safety experts in that building. It typically involves uh, the, the at, the, at an elementary level, for instance, a, a principal, a head custodian, a school nurse, a lead secretary, a school psychologist, and a key teacher in the building who become the main part of that safety team. Our training is going to go out to that next layer um, with, and also make it just a Q&A &A for the day of what is on people's minds. So that is, um, that'll be coming up in April as we um, pull those teams together. Um, we have also uh, been exploring, the middle school started with the exploration of a number of community members have contacted us about something called the Say Something program. It's actually in the wake of the uh, Sandy Hook. It's from, uh, it's from an organization that's known as Sandy Hook Promise. And uh, we had, the middle school had looked at this, and which really is a program encouraging students to do exactly what our students at Simsbury High did last week, to say something. When you have concerns, it's not only around um, violence, but if you have concerns around a depressed student, mm -hmm. to make sure you're saying something about mental health issues in your school if you're worried about somebody. Um, it's a very formalized program that uh, the folks in Newtown kind of put together, got some funding have taken to a, a regional and even national level and and that's a program that uh, we're going to bring somebody in from the organization um, a, 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 as based on what the middle school has been doing and looking at that program and then lastly you know that your capital improvement plan included uh, eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar request for security improvements we're working with mr. Leclerc's office to say exactly what would go on that list uh, if that uh, amount was to be approved by the town later this spring uh, and one of the things we need to do is with really principals and head custodians make sure that you know we we know we have some issues in our buildings that we've made massive improvements but there's some little things that still need to get done in each building and that's the list we're really looking to collect again in a, in a systematic way and make sure that if this funding comes through we can address some of those small issues that um, that could only improve what uh, our, our security efforts are. So um, it has, uh, you know, we've had a lot of communication from people outside. We have a lot of communication from people from the schools. I will end this by saying, uh, you know, in a test last Thursday, we did well. 
Um, and I hope this uh, uh, couple of minutes lets people know how seriously we're taking this stuff all the time. Neil, I would add one thing. Thursday morning, Neil and I are meeting with our, our PTO president's group, and we'll provide a similar kind of update, give them an opportunity to uh, ask some questions or things that are on their mind or give us some opinions of conversations that may be going on in their sc school community that will give us, you know, further insights into how people are feeling. Did, did the, does the consultant just base his, uh, his report on observation or did he interview uh, personnel as well? Interviewed <laughs> dozens of people all day long from parents to staff to sat down at the lunch tables with the kids. Great, um, great. Did all, spent literally great the, yeah. he, you could see he, t and he took hundreds of pictures throughout his days. The pictures, you could literally see them in the dark at 530 in the morning all the way to, he went dark, uh, dusk to dawn to dusk <laughs> and um, you know had uh, hundreds of pictures and recommendations wow. or pictures and um, some recommendations to offer to us and th it's uh, it's a lot to absorb we're already absorbing it and, and ready to kind of move into the training aspect of it is this the same consultant we used last time no different okay. different person thank you very much anyone else have any questions Thank you. Okay, back in January, uh, I gave a presentation on the vision of the graduate. So this Thursday, we're bringing our district leadership team together, a much larger group of educators from around the district, and starting them in the work around the vision of the graduate. So we're looking forward to that. And on March 26th, Monday is a full day PD day. It's going to be our annual technology conference. I met with John C. L. I. Twinnick today, and it looks like it's going to be an extremely engaging opportunity for teachers, and we have a number of teachers that are going to be presenting on that day as well so we look forward to to that full day of professional development around technology thank you nothing so there you. mr. Curtis uh, I would just add that last night uh, Maria presented her budget to the Board of Selectmen and she had uh, we had had some good communication before and I know that she's going to be a great uh, partner collaborating moving forward I think the two budgets combined uh, from her summary and how was was presented would lead to a mill rate decrease of 2.2 mills. So I mean, I just think in terms of moving forward to our presentation in a few weeks with the Board of Finance, I think we're in a, a, a positive place to start our conversations. Uh, and my hope again is we can uh, focus a bit of our time on the capital uh, projects that we have as well. Uh, we did have another meeting uh, with the town staff in looking at that overall five-year uh, six-year plan looking at their six-year plan and we are going to have to juggle some projects around to fit within that uh, 6.7 or 7 percent so we'll be coming back to the board uh, with that information uh, at a later date mm -hmm. questions thank you very much thank you all for your good reporting thanks Isabel that's a lot to say We've got a lot of sports teams doing things as well if it's a lot of good positive um, sports Absolutely. activities as well I don't know them, so I can't tell you them, but I know they're going on there. <laughs> basketball. <laughs> you know yeah. I know it's good. Yeah. Yeah. We have basketball on both sides is really good. Yeah, right. boys we and basketball. Girls and tomorrow playing Glastonbury at home. I believe boys playing Windsor tonight at Buckley High School in the semifinals of the And our diving CCC is tonight, and, and our swimming is it's tomorrow, night. tomorrow night. Yep, doing very well. Excellent. I'm sure hockey somewhere. Hockey was last night. Hockey. Their last game was last night. Okay. Anyway, moving on. We have the, um, <laughs> um, we can go into the approval of minutes. The February 13th meeting. Move to approve. Second. Excellent. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. And we are then going on to a gift to Century Public Schools, the um, Century High School Trojan Bust. Is that Mr. LeClaire? That is. Yes, I'm going to just start it off and then turn it over to uh, Andy and his team here tonight. Um, so this is a this is a, a uh, project um, for a Trojan bust, a bronze <coughs> bust, as you see a, a, um, a sample of here that would be placed outside of the main entrance uh, on a, a mounted on a brick type of uh, uh, base. And obviously the goal being to promote our school mascot and school uh, spirit. Um, and some of the, the, the larger group donations came from the class of uh, 2018, uh, the SPTC, class of 1987, and uh, the Student Council. In, uh, in addition to that, we've had 41 other individuals who have uh, either donated or, or given us uh, 
pledges. So we're asking for uh, acceptance of, of a total of up to $8,500. Um, but this, this project had a special um, start, and I wanted to let Andy uh, and his group uh, give you a little bit of background on that. So good evening. I'm here with uh, Jim Martoccio, who's um, Mr. And Mr. Bachelor's uh, former colleagues, and also with uh, Brennan McDermott, who was one of Mr. Bachelor's uh, students. This represents the realization of a dream that uh, Mr. Bachelor had when he was a class uh, co-advisor with Mr. Betty. He always had wanted uh, to have, he envisioned having this Trojan bust in a, in a place where athletes could go by and smack it and get inspired like they're in to go and compete and hit the field and uh, they researched it but when they looked at it at that time they thought well no nah, this probably could never happen and uh, they didn't pursue it any further but Mr. Betty actually kept the document so after uh, Mr. Bachelor had passed and we were trying to think of fitting ways to, to remember him or paying tribute etc this was something that Mr. Betty brought out and said hey you know I have this this uh, Trojan bust so um, I was then looking for people that would volunteer, and that's when Mr. Martoccio and uh, Brennan came out of the woodwork and rallied around helping to make this a reality. If you guys want to just take a minute and talk a little bit about some of the conversations that were had? Sure, yeah. The steps that were taken? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jim Martoccio, for those that don't know me. Um, I was very close with Mr. Mr. Bachelor Clark, who passed away um, recently, and this was one of his sort of, uh, one of his projects that he always really wanted. and. Um, it's funny because when we were talking to his uh, his wife Barb, we were like, Barb, do you remember Clark ever talking about this Trojan bus that he wanted? And she, she was like, Oh my gosh, he <laughs> talked about it all the time. <laughs> we never saw it. So we kind of wanted to clear it with her before we kind of moved any further with it. And um, getting that sort of spirit from her just really uh, yeah. led the led the charge. And I had Brennan in class, and the two of us got to talking about it, and we decided that this would not only be a fitting thing for sort of help remember Clark, but it's such a great spirit piece that could really do uh, be just a great focal point anywhere you put it in the school. And that was actually part of the hardest part was figuring out where do we put this beautiful sculpture. And um, you know, so we've been working all together to come up with some cool ideas for that. And the other cool thing too about it is is that so the artist that designs these and makes them um, is actually from Alaska, which Clark actually spent tons of time in uh, as a member of the Coast Guard out there, and he always speaks very highly of Alaska. I don't even think he knew that that's where this was from, because this is the original um, piece that he had sent out to some of his colleagues. Um, so when Brent dug it up and gave it to us, and we ended up having to go through and try to find out where the heck did he find this, and it turns out that this guy was in Alaska, and they've been great. So that's sort of a little background on it, and now we're just trying to iron out some of the details, but that's it's a great picture of what it'll look like. Yeah. Brennan, you've done some work around um, organizing funds, etc. Yeah, definitely. So one of the big aspects, I think, of this gift is not only honoring Mr. Bachelor's legacy, but also giving back to the school community. And I think that, you know, as you know, president of the class of 2018, one of the things that we wanted to set forth and set a precedent for was really giving back to the school, because not a lot of, you know, classes, you know, have really given something, especially to this magnitude, to the school. So you know, as my role as part of this, we really want to, you know, set the precedent so that, you know, the classes that follow us, you know, will be motivated to kind of give back to the school and, you know, you know, hopefully do something, you know, along the lines of this or what, however it may manifest itself. So I'm just, you know, really proud, uh, you know, to have worked, to have worked on this with Mr. Bartosz and Mr. O'Brien. Yeah. Excellent. I think there might be, is there one more image that shows the potential location? Um, no, okay, no, no. So, so uh, we have identified outside of the front steps when you approach the building. So if your back is to the field and you're facing the front door, to the left of that, uh, we were going to have constructed a, a brick pillar that would match the other brickwork that's there and kind of camped it at a 45 degree angle. So as you drive in or walk in an approach, you'll be facing uh, you know this this uh, Trojan bust, and it's also kind of set up so that if people did want to, you know, come and you know, as Mr. Bachelor envisioned, you know, give, it a, give it a high five, or even <laughs> even have teams or groups pose around this, it would be um, it'd be pretty cool. That's great. That sounds great. Thank you so much. So we so we, acceptance. We must accept this. What a wonderful um, community effort, and I love that everybody's participating in it. It's very nice.
Very much appreciated. And Brendan, thank you so much for all your work and gathering your troops as well. Thank you. So I would move that we accept this <laughs> with a lot of appreciation and fond memories of Mr. Bachelor and all he did for all his students. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. And please let um, Mrs. Bachelor know that we think of her often and we're very happy to have this as a tribute to him in our schools. Thank you, very much. Thank you guys for coming out. Very much appreciate Thanks. it. Excellent. That's wonderful. <laughs> Way to start. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're coming to, we need to make a motion to, we need to, uh, um, well, wait, where are we? Oh, we're not doing that yet. Sorry, I'm running ahead. Um, we're getting to the non-public school budget. Yep. We've all looked at it. We've talked about it. Does anyone have any thoughts, questions, or concerns that they want to bring up? And I would, I would uh, entertain a motion to accept it. I'll move that the Board of Education adopt the 2018-19 non-public school budget in the amount of $543,490, which represents a decrease of $776, or minus 0.14%. Second. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. So we have passed the non the non public school budget. Um, we're going to move on to the um, adoption of our public school budget. We've been working on that all all winter, and uh, we had a great presentation last week, very fully and discussed. Um, does anyone have any thoughts, concerns? I'd love to hear what everyone thinks about our budget for the going year. And if anyone has any questions, now is a great time to bring them up. Tom. I have no questions, but I do just want to comment for the benefit of the public that might be watching this broadcast that um, I've been on this board for, I think, three years now, two and a half years. And, and uh, once again, I was very, very impressed with the, the rigor of, um, involved in the preparation of this budget, uh, the rigor involved in the board's review of this budget. Um, we're we're we're, we're going to vote on it now with probably with very little discussion. But I I, I want to make sure the public understands that a great deal of work has gone into the uh, the study and the ana analysis of this budget. And I also just want to comment that um, facing a difficult situation where we had to make economies, uh, I I was I for one was very impressed with the um, the discipline that the district team applied to this budget in order to find to find economies, um, but to not in any way compromise the quality of education in the system. And I just want to compliment, I just want to make that comment. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jen? Good. I mean, I, I agree with everything Tom says. I think uh, everyone did a fantastic job. I know it's a lot of hard work, and you know, I think it's, it's good to point out that we'll just kind of vote today, but it's been months of, uh, of hard work by everybody especially the team here, uh, and uh, it's much appreciated. I think it's a great result. Um, I really did appreciate kind of the unique views you guys took and the exercises you went through to get at every line item from every angle. And um, while I was not at the last meeting, I was at the workshop, and I watched the last meeting and saw the presentation. And I think it's... Um, the slide that always sticks with me is how many years we're running on these 1% budgets and we're still getting the accolades and we're still giving our students what they need to be successful. And I think that that is such a testament to the school system we've all built together, but I think that that really says so much about what we do for these kids and how we try to keep the cuts from hitting them where it could harm that result. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. That's really all I have to say. Excellent. Um, I think, again, it, it, we're all saying the same thing, but it's we weren't saying the same thing along the way. We had a lot of questions. We had a lot of concerns. We were thinking of everyone in this room has brought um, their concerns. No one wants to make the cuts we've had to make. But I think that this is a solid uh, effort to meet our Board of Finances request mm -hmm. and to um, work within that framework. And everyone did a wonderful job. And I, too, uh, am very thankful for how this all came together and all the work that everybody at this table and in this room have put forward. And all the principals in their schools did a, nice job. Did a great job this year and were very helpful <coughs> to get to where we need to be. Um, saying that, I would entertain a motion. 
Chair, I'll, I'll move the, that the Board of Education adopt the 2018-19 public school budget in the amount of 69 million three hundred and fourteen thousand five hundred and fifty two with it. Which represents an increase of one million one hundred eighty nine thousand three hundred and eighty two or one point seven five percent. Second that much. motion. Thank you, Tom. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? The motion carries. We have passed this year's budget. We will move on to working with our town and board of finance. finance yes. And taking it to the next phase. Um, moving on, due to the Board of Education's budget presentation, as we were just speaking of, to the Board of Finance, um, on March 13th, we will need to cancel that Board of Education meeting, and I need a motion to do so, please. So moved. Second? I second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So um, on March 13th, we will not have a Board of Education meeting, but we will have a Board of Finance meeting, so um, we hope to see everyone there. Our next uh, report, it's very nice to see Neil and Jan, <laughs> Mrs. Sands. Um, <laughs> and we're going to <laughs> 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 that really yeah, on. So teacher, good team. teacher evaluation and mentoring program, and um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you right. so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So I told Jan I would join her at the table, so this hopefully you good. can get the yeah. juxtaposition here. But, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what the juxtaposition is. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun to watch. I'm going to analyze that as you speak. Your better yeah. side. <laughs> um, so th this is basically a presentation about how we um, formally support first and second year teachers really into the profession, not just first and second year teachers into Simsbury, but um, it is a uh, team is a program developed by the, uh, the state um, and Connecticut, quite frankly, has been a leader in teacher induction for, for quite some time. And the team, if you read nationally about teacher induction, Connecticut um, gets a lot of kudos for the strength of the team program. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Jan's involvement in that. Uh, Jan, right now, is our district facilitator from TEAM. She comes to that work um, as a true expert at the state level from the previous version of this. Some of you who know uh, education may remember the BEST program, which was how we supported new teachers uh, uh, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, really, um, which was a very portfolio-based program. Jan actually, mid-career, took a few years leave from Simsbury and had a job as a consultant at the state um, which it was uh, we lent her she was not permanently but we allowed her to have that experience as a leader for the best program and was a major uh, player in the switch over to team um, at the state level as as that happened so uh, when she came back to Simsbury after our, our stint there was over um, it's important to understand that our district committed part of her teaching schedule is actually committed to being our district facilitator for team it's that important to us and we we put um, somebody really as a leader in it um, and and that's how Jan serves in that role now our presentation tonight is give you just a little bit of background about what team is let Jan talk to you about what we do in Simsbury but specifically to talk about some very sudden and unexpected changes that came from the state and how how those are impacting districts and sort of how Simsbury um, has reacted to that. So um, as you can see, the, the first few slides are just to give you the background of what TEAM is. And it is a two-year induction program that involves those new teachers paired with a mentor through a very structured set of activities that are professional development to get you kind of up to speed and build your expertise as you enter into a very challenging profession. Um, part, much of that involves not only work with the new teachers, but training the mentors, making sure that they are ready to take on that leadership role with, uh, the, with the new teachers and learn the system of how they are expected to work through the plans that the teachers develop to support their growth. Um, first and second year teachers must uh, complete this process in order to move from uh, the certification when you first come out of college and get certified you get an initial educator certificate that's only good for a few years and you have to move into what they call a provisional educator certificate and you can't move to that next level of certification unless you've completed 
team and the superintendent has to certify that people have done that before they can move on and um, it's all based on five modules that are aligned to the teaching standards for the state of Connecticut so this next slide sort of shows you how the domains of the Connecticut teaching standards turn into modules for team so the the first major domain of content and essential <laughs> teaching skills are kind of embedded in all the modules and then uh, teachers have gone through four of the modules involve a, a cycle of reflection papers that they write um, in Simsbury our first year teachers do too they do classroom environment and then planning in the order that's presented on the slide and then second year teachers do instruction and assessment so it's two cycles in each of the first two years module five is uh, or I, module five domain six is uh, another uh, more of a one-shot program where it's this really interesting facilitated discussion that Jan and her other uh, master mentors run which is problem solving and just ethics questions with teachers and it's this uh, three-hour session that usually our mentor teachers who come come back and say that was more interesting for them because they <laughs> start to wrestle with some questions that they maybe haven't wrestled with in a little while so um, the process in those modules that do involve a, a reflection paper um, ha it starts in the upper left hand corner they identify a need in that particular module so let's take the first one is learning environment often a, a teacher will identify something I need uh, and for a first year te teacher that's often the normal routines and norms of a classroom. How do I settle my class in for the day? How do I get start? How do, how do I um, maybe run a morning meeting or just take attendance and uh, seating arrangements in my class? What does all of that look like as kids? You identify that that's the area you wanna grow in. You develop an action plan that usually involves doing some reading and research, going out and watching other teachers, meeting with your mentor to talk about how it's going and problem solving around a very specific uh, growth area that you've identified. Implementing that plan um, and reflecting upon it and then ultimately writing a uh, a paper that gets that uh, in the pe in the previous iteration was submitted into a, a queue in the state that then got looked at almost always approved but if not you had a chance to redo the, mo the module and and just a, a cycle of growth that uh, was really uh, well structured and, and, and well done much uh, improved over the portfolio program that existed before which was this really stressful very large thing that happened in year two and the often big video teachers, I remember the big video yeah mm -hmm. teachers you felt very overwhelmed wearing those scars <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so that's the module process it um, again it, there's some changes to that that's happened but Jan's going to talk you through how we've done uh, what our, our Simsbury philosophy of this is and some of the things we've done over many years as a uh, the chief cheerleader for the town of Simsbury a role I think I carry pretty well um, <laughs> I think one of the things we do really well here is support our new teachers and when we were moving from best to team and a, a group of us sat and said well what is it that we want um, to offer to our new teachers. And first and foremost, we wanted to make people feel part of something bigger than themselves. We wanted to establish relationships. Um, that matters a lot to me. And I think that if you establish relationships, uh, people will do anything for you and walk through water with you. Um, and we wanted them to do those accompanied by a mentor, someone who was actually assigned to you. You didn't have to go through the hall crying to find someone. Not that there wouldn't be multiple people available, but there was one person in particular, and this has always been very important to me as a, since the time I was a new teacher here, that there were always people to whom I could turn for academic support, for personal support they planned my wedding they <laughs> uh, did everything in my whole life that I think of that has happened my colleagues have planned for me um, <laughs> but where to go when it's all seems lost to celebrate the the successes with we felt that if people felt con that connection and those relationships were built that these new educators that were hired here would want to stay we I think that the con one of the um, reasons Simsbury has such an excellent system 
is because people have stayed o over my career. There has been a consistency that has really made, um, made a difference in kids' lives. Uh, so that was one of our first um, missions, to make sure that people felt supported with not only their mentors, but a bigger group. Secondly, we wanted to make sure that these mentors had the skills that they needed to support the new teachers. Because the, we want people to stay, we, but we also want people to grow and learn and become successful in their classrooms for kids. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure that while these mentors, mentor, there are a lot of teachers like me who um, love teaching but want other opportunities to be teacher leaders uh, without leaving our classrooms. And this also provides a very important function for those people who, who really want to give back to our profession and lend some of our expertise. I will say that mentors learn as much from mentees as um, the mentees learn from mentors. This isn't a case of mentors filling empty heads with <laughs> lots of data. And uh, it is a two-way street, and it's a very engaging process. And it's a w oh, I'm talking too long, Katie, no, no, which no, is the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that, so I, you have to rein me in, Katie, you know. Um, there is is, um, it's a, just a win-win for mentors. Uh, you cannot help in engaging in that reflective process that Neil showed. Experienced teachers continually um, engaging in that process, it's just a win-win. Um, I always like to say you cannot just um, phone it in when you're mentoring mm -hmm. because everyone's watching you and you, we are role models and we are expected to um, practice what we preach and I think it's a win-win for all. Some of the ways that we are supportive over the past 10 years, um, first of all, this, I, I, there are very few teachers in the state who serve in my role. Um, it, there, Avon has one and we are we don't know any others um, because most usually people who will serve in my role or Aaron's role who are the district facilitators. So the fact that we commit a portion of a teacher's schedule is important. It's very and Aaron and I are very grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> as, as are we. It's, um, it, it's very significant that um, we, this this um, mentoring and new teacher support isn't like Aaron or Neil or Sue's or Matt's 500th task on their list that day. Um, so it really, it really has been important. And uh, the central administration always receives kudos from me for um, being so supportive. Um, the, we have a team team. Uh, there are um, five of us, uh, two elementary representatives, and then a middle school representative, and then another high school representative along with me, so that hopefully we can be more responsive to the needs of all of the levels and all of the issues. Uh, believe it or not, the second one up there sounds like a no-brainer, but in many districts this doesn't happen. We do everything, thanks to Cindy Freelinger and Neil, matching mentors and mentees in the same discipline, in the same building. That sounds, that sounds like nothing, but nothing could be more important. Um, even though we're talking about best practices in teaching, teachers want to talk about Spanish with another teacher. <laughs> teachers want to talk about, I'll say math, with another teacher. <laughs> um, it, it's really very important, and um, that has been one of the, the keystones of our success, I think. Um, we plan, it's a very hands-on program. We, are to, we meet together in August at orientation. September, we start to talk about goal planning. Uh, as the year goes on, we meet monthly. Uh, we have instituted uh, a process where each new teacher must meet in a separate meeting face-to-face -face with a building principal to discuss goals. We thought that that mattered for both principal and beginning teacher so that um, all would be aware of the challenges being faced and what support was necessary. We have provided all sorts of references and resources, including a monthly calendar of activities for mentors in case they're, they're at wit's end of how to help. Uh, we celebrate. <laughs> That's my favorite part. Um, <laughs> every, everyone gets invited, mentors and mentees and administrators and principals to two team celebrations a year that the um, SEA helps to sponsor. These are just a few things of what we do. 
and I'll just add on the face to face meeting with the building principal, it's actually separate uh, from the evaluation process. Mm -hmm. So uh, first and second year teachers being evaluated, but this meeting is about your goal setting around this process and it happens with your mentor and the principal as well. So it's actually much meant to be much more as this is we're in a supportive building skills mode than we are in an evaluative mode right now. That's very, very important. So um, the next slide is a little bit about what's happened with the state budget and Jan told me she would not talk in any way about the money so I had to take this slide. <laughs> so um, what happened is as uh, the budget passed for this year and many legislators didn't even realize that all funding for team was out. So the state had much of what used to happen at the state level was de facto p passed to the districts. And Jan had to attend the district facilitator meetings at that time really unsure of what was going to happen. And basically with them saying to districts, you're still responsible to do all of this. We just aren't offering the support we used to offer um, with personnel at the state level with some of the funding that used to come from the state level and some of the sources of the, and structures that supported the program. So even though the funding was eliminated, districts are still responsible to match mentees and train mentors. That part has stayed the same. But the second bullet, and it's in red to show that this was an impact, we used to receive a $500 uh, reimbursement for each mentor from the state. So on an average year, that could look like about $10,000 because we would have 20 mentors and th th the stipend was attached. We would pay them through the SEA contract agreement, but then Burke would get a check back from the state in the summer saying that is not coming. And that so sometimes when people talk about unfunded mandates, it's in the murkiness of this involves more work for this is a straight they shut off the money and it's not coming and districts are just expected to pick it up. Um, and, and we will be doing that. Um, obviously the, continue, the, the module process has continued, but what used to happen when you determined the success of a module, a teacher turned their reflection paper into this system in the state. It was read anonymously by, by trained um, readers at the state and somebody approved it or said it still needed more work. That entire system was also shut off without notice that we were not, there was not going to be any ability to submit papers to the state anymore. And also then, therefore, to attest that teachers had successfully completed that is now much more on the district to say each module has been completed. So upon receiving that news without a lot of clarification, the team team that uh, Jan talked about, along with Aaron and I, held a series of meetings to say, let's not worry about what the state's going to do. What is Simsbury going to do to solve this problem? And then Jan's going to pick it up again because I think we came up with a pretty good solution. We reassured mentors and mentees that what they were doing would not change. They would still continue to meet and talk about goals and reaching them and what was happening in their classroom and sharing experiences. But now we had to come up with a way to evaluate uh, this, the, the success of this reflective cycle. So we decided most people uh, learned so much from sharing with each other that we would try out um, a series of, in small groups, a series of guided reflective workshops. So we invited um, s small groups of beginning teachers with me and with uh, one of the, my teammates. Um, and we asked them to come ready to talk about some of these questions up here. So what have they learned during the module preparation? How is the new learning changed their teaching? Most importantly, how is this new learning and changes in instruction impacted their kids? Um, how do they know? That's one of the things that we work a lot at um, in, in helping them be able to articulate how they know that changes are impacting their kids. And then, because I believe in positivity, um, dogs or otherwise, um, <laughs> what do I need to do to make it continue to go well? Uh, focusing on the positive, identifying what is it that's happening, that's going well in the classroom, and what do I need to do to continue that? Um, so we met four small groups, um, again, a sign half, half day sessions. Yes, again, a sign of support. Uh, they provided release time for these teachers. And um, we, we asked for feedback. And um, we, th we think that there's one answer that will just kind of encapsulate um, 
we think the success of this, because we're planning to do this again in May, based on their um, their responses, they were they were really engaging, enriching conversations. Um, I, I had so much fun over two days. Uh, it's impossible to not be moved um, and go back excited into your classroom the next day. Um, this comment um, was about the disadvantages of of documenting your reflections on paper. So she, he or she wrote, there is a lack of otherness when writing a paper to be viewed by one person that is then approved or denied. By that I mean that other people's ideas and experiences can be infinitely more valuable to your own reflection process. Just being reminded that you are not doing all this alone, even with a supportive mentor, makes it better. The discussions today made me feel more comfortable with my own experiences and reflection process, and I honestly just loved hearing how other people are doing in their second year of teaching. That was representative of their, um, their reactions. Future- You got through it without tearing up. I, I know. I, some of these verbs, though, are just great. <laughs> <laughs> Complete uncertainty at the state level. We know nothing right now, nothing about the future of this program, but we, we are remaining committed to new teachers growing together with their mentors and mentors growing together with their new teachers, as well as um, Neil added that innovative PD to my, <laughs> I hope it's innovative. Uh, we will continue to deliver uh, innovative PD to support our mission. We're not sure what that is right now, right. but we're going to continue to grow and learn along with them. Right. Well, I said it was innovative because after we did a facilitated discussion to get through the fall modules, mm -hmm. I just noticed that CREC added on to their professional devel <laughs> development that they're going to do a facilitated discussion for the next mm. module. So I think, I think an interesting model. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where they got that. Yeah, I think word I think spreads. They took it. So Jan talked about her team team. I just want to publicly by name recognize oh, um, the others besides Jan, <laughs> who is our facilitator, the other master mentors in our district, which takes an extra level of training, are Sharon Cabell at Squadron Line, Paige Colantonio at Central School, Laurel Archambault at Henry James, and Rob Jeffers uh, of the high school. Um, so those are the members of the team team, along with Jan, myself, definitely Aaron, who contributes a lot to this process, but um, I got chosen to be at the table tonight. So um, <laughs> that's our presentation. Any out. questions or? I, I would just say this. Um, thank you very much to both of you for putting it together, and I would say that we always talk about uh, how difficult and challenging it can be to create and sustain excellence in your organization. And we know finding top talent is crucial and then retaining that mm -hmm. top talent, which Jan talked about at the beginning of the presentation, is absolutely essential. Uh, I couldn't be more comfortable than your leadership, Jan, and anybody. I remember when I was in HR and we were first hatching this out, you, myself, and Aaron, and, and working through, and it's come along in such a productive way. Um, you're an amazing teacher leader. You're a positive force to not only the kids, but the adults in this district. So um, this is something we're real proud of and wanted to, to put it out front in the board tonight. Uh, and I know they'll answer any questions that you do have. He's just still trying to make you cry, sorry. <laughs> sorry? He's just still trying to make you cry, sorry. Oh, it's not too hard. <laughs> I just, oh, I was go just going to say, I just so appreciate that at the heart of this we're really looking to make those new teachers really feel a part of yeah. something bigger and not lost in a classroom on their own mm -hmm. and the commitment to continuing this is admirable and I appreciate all the hard work you're all doing to make sure that it happens well and um, that these new teachers continue to get supported because it's I, I think it can be really daunting it certainly it's can a hard be profession. it is hard yeah <laughs> sounds like you know talk about unfunded mandates and a lot of them are just oh my gosh but this is one that if it was not mandated it sounds like it's something we would would definitely it, keep anyway. uh, yeah. and it's money uh, well spent, well spent. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Mm. So this and, I, and I think the superintendent's organization is really gonna push that, in yeah. effort to get that at least that reimbursement back because that I, th I think that, you know, a big piece of fiscal legislation passes and people don't know everything that's in the soup. Mm -hmm. And when they turned around and said that got cut, I think a lot of superintendents were caught by surprise. Correct. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I just wanted to 
I guess ask a question about the modules themselves because the first question that came to my mind before you got into the presentation was whether or not uh, uh, we created these modules ourselves and are the, and are the mentors can use all using the same materials or does each mentor decide what to do but I take from the presentation that everyone's using the same modules yes. is that correct yes. so this consistency across every mentor Yes, in and part of, of the way we organized it in Simsbury too, because we, we had the freedom to organize it the way we wanted, mm -hmm. um, we decided a long time ago that we would have year one teachers do classroom environment together with yeah. along with um, planning so that they, as a group, would have each other for support as well, the mentors and new teachers, and then the same second year, they would work together so that there would be all sorts of uh, ripples in the water, we hoped, that would be helping each other. But yes, sure. it's a very structured, mm -hmm. based is, on that connection. It is structured and used consistently. But then a related question really is, do have you had, have you and your team had the, the flexibility to modify these modules uh, to improve them, to change them, to, to, to customize them for our own needs here in Simsbury, or not? This, actually, this program, mm -hmm. one of the advantages of this over best is that there is a lot of flexibility. Oh. Um, there, is, there is a continuum of effective teaching, and each teacher looks at it and chooses an area in which they feel they would like to grow. Oh. So it's very, while it's structured, there is lots of room for individual choice and growth. And that's one of the positives that we work to make sure that this is relevant and real to each teacher in his or her classroom. That each teacher is working on what he or she feels is necessary for him or her and his or her kids. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I'm sorry to be so lengthy about this, but this is really, really important. I just want to ask the question, and that might not be a fair question in this environment, but but the whole intent of this is to is to is to have excellence in the classroom and you've mentioned the idea of teacher retention mm -hmm. as a very very important objective of this program i didn't even know it existed and i'm really impressed with it. but do we have a metric about retention uh i mean uh, it's something we in, in fact have we measured a retention yeah we do mm -hmm. i and i should have brought some data for you but i'll could bring you something for the next meeting. It's something we review at our, we have two meetings a year where Aaron and I go out with the team. Mm -hmm. And um, just uh, last year they said, could you bring us some teacher retention data? Oh. And we looked at the reasons why every teacher who did leave Simsbury, mm -hmm. could we name the specific reason why they left? And we went literally teacher by teacher and talked about um, the, you know the good news is the percentage was much higher of those who stayed mm -hmm. but we actually did an analysis of any who did leave either the district or the profession why that was yeah I really don't want to make any extra work for anybody but mm -hmm. but to you know actually just get some sense for how we're doing on retention wouldn't mm -hmm. be a bad idea. no and it's very important yeah. okay thank, thank you so much for what you do thank you we thank really you appreciate it <laughs> Thanks for coming and talking to us. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And sh thanks for showering us with your enthusiasm, Jen. Oh, yeah. no. Easy. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it is easy. It's wonderful working with Jan. She is teacher of the year. Um, yes, teacher of the year. She has been, and just a wonderful role model for for our teachers in the district. And so it's been she is great working wonderful. with her. Erin, yeah. do they do this program for teachers that start a new grade but are existing, or is it just for teachers like out of college or? It's their first two years of teaching. We have actually a model within Simsbury where we do assist teachers through some of our coaches and resource teachers to help teachers that move grade levels. Okay. So we do we do focus on that. We also do hire people coming in in their second year who have to get into the team uh, process as well. Okay. So that's the other piece that we were a little bit worried about when we heard about this is that how are we gonna know what people have accomplished if there is no longer that database? So it's just word of mouth and contact with uh, the districts from which they come from. Um, but it, it does have a direct tie to their certification, and we think it's, it's, it's been such a positive program. So um, it's been fun to work with Jan. Excellent. <laughs> really wonderful. Yep. Um, we're going to move on now to, the, um, to Ms. Mrs. Murphy as well. Okay. Update on the uh, school start time. All right. So I mean, I would just say to, to kind of tee this up. This is a this is a brief presentation, really much more about process tonight than it is about outcome. So I just want to be clear on that. Aaron's going to give us an overview of some of the uh, meetings that have taken place in the study group that 
uh, leadership team uh, that has taken this topic on. It's a topic certainly that I know has garnered a lot of board interest uh, as well as community and faculty interest. So we do have some, some key data to share at this point, but uh, again, it's much more about process and the outcome later on in the year will be a much more detailed and in-depth report. Mm -hmm. So this topic came up following last year's leadership team meeting on stress and uh, kids and the committee members began to talk about school start time. So we thought this was a good uh, topic to bring to this year's committee and we expanded the committee. It's a comprehensive K-12 committee where it has administrators from the high school, the middle school, the elementary schools. Uh, we have students from the middle school, we have students from the high school, parents, teachers from both the middle school and the high school and our board members were Susan and Todd that have been part of this and again as Matt said this has certainly been an exploratory year for us to try to figure out what we need to know about rethinking school start times so our goal really has been um, to identify the potential benefits and questions that would be associated with moving school start times um, later in the morning for our middle and for our high school. And we're not alone in this process. Um, we've been working, I've been working very closely with uh, two other uh, colleagues, one from West Hartford and one from South Windsor, and they are both in the exploratory mode as well. West Hartford a little bit ahead of us, we're in the middle, and South Windsor behind. And so we get together about every month uh, to talk about the work that's going on in their districts. Um, other districts in Connecticut that have already altered their school times, uh, Greenwich, Newtown, Wilton, um, Ridgefield just voted, their Board of Education just voted that they will implement a new school start time in uh, the start of the 2019-20 school year. Um, another district that we got connected with um, that has a very similar profile to us in Simsbury is Newton Mass and um, very much um, excited about learning more about their work as well. They have, they're larger than us, they have two, uh, two high schools in New Newton, Mass. Um, we also have had the opportunity, um, a, a student teacher that worked with Brent Betty um, at the high school is finished up the first semester and the second semester is working as an intern and she's doing a lot of research for us. She's gone out and collected data on school start times for our DERGs and in various places um, around Connecticut and she's reaching out to other districts as well. But she connected with Newtown and the principal at Newtown High School is open to putting a panel of students together and for us to come down and um, talk with them about the work and hopefully we could potentially get some teachers as well that we could do. So we're looking forward to that. So uh, very fortunate to have her to be able to pull that information together. So as an overview of the work that we've done since September, we started by uh, looking at research. We pulled about five or six different articles that we um, passed out to various members within the committee. Um, and we also worked on creating a survey. And I think the important part, when you see the survey data and when you're thinking about the survey data, when we created it, we were really looking at creating some baseline data. We had not given out information. We had not really schooled people in what it meant to change school tar start times. We really wanted to get just information opinions, perceptions from families, from students, and from teachers about this notion of changing the school start time. Uh, so we started in September. Um, in November, we went through, and our ultimate goal, as I had said a few minutes ago, is to really identify those benefits and questions, and the list is growing as we're meeting. We, we keep adding to that list. Um, in January, we had Dr. Daniel McNally, who came from UConn, a sleep expert, and we had about 25 or 30 people in the audience that evening. Um, so it was great, and I'll have some information I can share with you on that. In January, the end of January, we heard from Jeff Penny, our athletic director, who gave us some information on athletics and extracurriculars. And uh, we reviewed the school, uh, the survey data at that point. Um, in March, on March 29th, Neil has been working, I think, since the beginning of the school year, looking at our transportation, a very complex, um, uh, you know, explore, exploration of how we've used our transportation in the past and what it could or might look like. So we're all waiting.
waited, waiting with bated breath to see what that information <laughs> is going to give to us. We have no idea what to Pressure expect. just increased. Yeah, really. <laughs> Neil, maybe you should go down. <laughs> and then um, in May, the committee will work to pull together the, the list of benefits and questions um, that we will want to present to you. And potentially, once we know what the bus runs could be, we might even propose some schedules that we could even be thinking about at that point in time. So just to give you some um, big ideas of what we've gathered so far in this school year, uh, the research certainly says that the, the most influential benefit of a later start time for adolescents is their health and well-being. Um, so something that any article that you read on this, um, whether it's through the American Pediatric Association, the Center for uh, Disease Control, is sa says that during this adolescent development period that you will see some increase in academic performance, uh, less auto accidents, less tardiness. Um, <laughs> that more sleep for students is extremely beneficial and it not only does it uh, provide them more sleep but certainly adds to a positive culture within the building and certainly decreases the tardinesses tardiness that can occur so dr mcnally gave us um, a great opening of about 20 25 minutes of just really the medical aspects behind um, sleep for adolescents and uh, then opened it up to questions um, and and um, it was a very engaging conversation um, so again uh, he supported um, that through his research and and his work in this field is that there is evidence that supports um, better academic um, outcomes outcomes and that attendance um, improves. Um, that the change um, for these students is, is it, it was interesting as he talked about the circadian rhythm and the ways in which students um, as we all go through these developmental stages that people tend to think that you're automatically just going to push everything later in the night and go to sleep later and he was saying that that's not actually the case that you typically will stay with your same bedtime and get about 52 extra minutes of sleep a night um, and um, so that was an interesting someone had posed that question it's starting to sound pretty good isn't it <laughs> <laughs> um, he actually uh, talked to us about and it was a football coach and I believe it was in Wisconsin or Minnesota area and uh, again sports is when we heard from Jeff Penny there are certainly some areas that we have to think long and hard about there's there's real issues that that can present challenges to us but he talked about a football coach who was very much against adamant against Against changing the start times couldn't imagine how uh, f practice times could be shortened or um, just couldn't imagine how this would work and probably he said four to six weeks into the season came back and said I can get so much more done in a shorter time period of practice than we could before because the focus of these students is so much better um, so that was people pushed him on that in the in the questions um, and he you know as he said clearly the the sleep time for these students that you know from middle school through high school seven and a half to eight and a half hours of sleep is what's most important and it's not simply that you could you know what some people think is that you can sleep six or seven hours a night throughout the week and on the weekend you could sleep 10 or 12 hours how many of us have you know at noontime you know trying to get our kids out of bed and he's saying you know that's really not ideal Deal. It's not ideal for any of us that we should be, you know, trying to stay as consistent with our bedtimes and our times that we get up. That it, you can't make up your sleep on the weekends. You might feel better at the moment, but it doesn't help. Um, and obviously, more sleep, you know, certainly helps students overall in their health and their well being. So as we go into um, some of these survey results, I'll talk a, a little bit, just give you an idea. We had 1,157 families respond to the survey. We had- Is that a record? I think so. Beat out the calendar survey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> a lot of opinions on the calendar. 
We had 1,245 students. They were a very captive audience, so that's why we did get, we did eighth grade through, and then ninth through 12th grade. And teachers and faculty, 400 uh, teachers and faculty that, that um, responded. And as I said, this again was a baseline. This was a way for that we could um, get information and know what we might need to give more information and um, be able to help people understand uh, why, the, what the research says and so on. So again, um, looking to gather that baseline data is really about their opinions their perceptions and their personal impact that you'll see so you'll get some of this as we look at this first uh, result survey result so that you can see those in favor of a later start time are the parents 71 percent of our parents said that they would prefer and this was elementary middle and high school um, uh, families that responded to this um, our middle school and high school teachers are at 47 percent and our students are at 40 uh, about 40 percent um, in favor and again it's interesting We're, we need to dig more deeper into the data and we need to do more teaching and gathering information some sessions with with people as well but um, these data are from uh, b before the parents and before the teachers and before the students were made aware of all this research correct we haven't done any teaching per se yeah, in that okay. regard and we purposely chose that because we wanted to get a sense of what it a lot of the information that we gathered back for example the teachers um, most um, when you look at the faculty and staff it was really about their child care issues it was about um, when you think about you know you're gonna change my time of day Jeez, it's, yeah. so child care and elder care um, types of things gym memberships a lot that came up a lot for people that that go in the afternoon so those are things that we have to continue to flush through mm -hmm. um, Parents, uh, they said that their point of view on the benefit is that 74% that, you know, the kids would sleep later, that, that would, they would definitely get much more sleep, they'd be more focused, and that it would reduce stress on students with a later start time. Well, we look at what the teacher said, and this is where you can see where they were talking about themselves, but they also talked about um, students is that they were worried that it would push back their extracurricular and their sports activities later in the day, which that would then cause homework to be an issue as well, that um, students um, would miss class. And I, that's what we heard, and I'll talk about it in a minute, with athletics, that um, if we push it later in the day, buses have to leave, they have to get students to other communities in which to participate in sports, they could be missing some school time. And that's, teachers were worried about that. Hmm. Um, they thought that they would stay up later and thought that they might not have time to be able to hold down a job um, after school. But what we do know, 58% of our students said that they don't work. Um, so that was another data point that we had. Um, but when we, one of the questions from the teachers is that 63% um, of the teachers indicated that a later start time certainly would allow the, t the, the students to get more rest. And some of the things that they said about students in the first period is that they're groggy, mm -hmm. they don't participate as freely, and a lot of tardiness in first period. So they see that as well. Um, some student responses when they look at this um, when they were you know the number of students that get up 52 percent of our students are up before 6 a.m. in the morning um, so that's an early time that that students are getting up um, most of our students 61 percent of our students are going to bed by 11 o'clock uh, at night um, homework and this, this is a sort of a byproduct of this work that we're looking into 68% um, of our students have at least three ho three hours of homework a night um, we do have some data where we can look at our high school separately from the middle school 74% of our high school students say that they have at one to four hours of homework a night so it's in, interesting information, and I think that's an area that we're going to have to pay some attention to. And we um, do know getting into this and in your conversation, I don't want to jump in, but your conversations fine. with other districts, Yes. some of the advice we had was the conversation about school start time should parallel the conversation about homework mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. terms of stressors right. and management of, of things that are really having an impact on kids' lives. Right. So it's, it's interesting data. Right. That was in our book, too. <laughs> right. I'm just saying. 
And when asking um, students, <laughs> oh, you're uh, teacher's the, pack. The book Aaron gave. Say, the, I was in the it first in four there. chapters. It is. Um, Good for so you. Slide that one in. That <laughs> and when wow. students were asked why they're tardy, because that tended to be a, a, a big response, is because they oversleep. Fifty percent of our kids say they 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 are tardy to school because they oversleep. Um, well, we look at the athletics and the extracurricular report. Um, one of the, the pie chart at the top, it's, it shows you that um, in, for high school students in the fall, we have 43% of our students participate in a fall sport, 30% in a winter sport, and 52% in a spring sport. That makes a lot of sense. Fall, you know, is, is, a, is a larger time. Winter teams are smaller and not as many, but springtime, we have a lot of sports that go out. 30% of our high school students do not participate in a sport. But what you can see from this is that um, what we, when we found a couple of articles regarding um, athletics is that um, performance measurably increases with additional sleep, that there's increases in GPA, um, in uh, standardized test scores, um, all of those kinds of things that we've talked about already were supported in the literature regarding the um, athletics and extracurricular. One of the things that we came upon in our study on this is that what, what we do know about kids, a lot of football kids and other sports, where not only do they have to have the practice, but there is a uh, strength and conditioning component to their day. So they have to do that maybe for an hour and then go off uh, for practice as well, is that we might be able to look at some curricular opportunities and embed strength and conditioning within the school day. So add it to our PE program so that it wouldn't add to extra time after. So that was a benefit that the committee thought we should, we should um, look at. When you look at the questions, this is not a surprise. Our availability of facilities, we've been talking about that a lot. So the way in which we currently operate, we have difficulty. We have one field with lights, and um, we've been talking about another uh, field um, at the high school. So something to be thinking about. Uh, the coordination of schedules, academic and athletic, the CIAC sports, um, they have a general start time of all sports after school as 345. So depending on your time of day um, could certainly impede upon that start time. Um, the loss of instructional time, we talked about that. That's a worry. Uh, we also have coaches, uh, teachers that are coaches within um, the system that would end up having to leave their classes to get on the bus and go with the sports. So that's of concern. And then transportation, without knowing what the transportation report is yet, but you know, you'd have to juggle, you know, transportation at the end of the day and trying to make sure you, you didn't, um, that you had enough of, of busing um, for that. So as we learn more, um, as we go through the remainder of our meetings, we will let this list of potential benefits and questions um, you know, come together and we will be prepared to um, present that to you in June to give you a little bit more depth and detail around uh, what we've been looking at over the course of the school year. So what a change might look like, we don't know. We don't know what that will be, but um, we'll be better prepared in June to give you more information. And as I said earlier, I'd like to maybe be able to give you a couple of different schedules that if this is something that we, that you wanted us to explore further, that we could even look at those as well. I mean, that transportation piece is just so key Critical. in creating okay. uh, options yeah. because we have a very unique three tiered run right now. I won't get into the complexities of it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a something we have to look at. Big piece to look Neil at. looks very excited about building. <laughs> He's digging into it. He likes this stuff. <laughs> yes. Some districts. Giant some districts, I know West Hartford uh, came out with some alternative times. I think that was something within our surveys that was difficult for teachers because there was, we never said, we just said what would it look like with a 30 minute late start, what yeah. would it look like with a 60 minute late start, and there was a, this assumption that then you would then just flip yeah. elementary and what would that mean. We didn't, we didn't give any clarification on that at this point yet. Um, but um, so more, more information um, on that. 
So we'll come back to you in June and um, give you um, further information that we have. Um, and we would be looking for you um, to give us guidance on what the next steps should be as we move forward. Um, if it was something um, that this is what we shared with our committee is that um, through this year of exploration, if the Board of Education would like us to continue exploring this, we would use another full year of exploration um, for you to be able to bring back to you much more detailed information. So we wouldn't even be looking at an implementation, implementation until 2019, 20, uh, 2020. And with the four, well, the four, well, five now with Ridgefield, was there a consistency of what they pushed the times back to? So interesting, Newtown uh, went to 8 o'clock, uh, Greenwich went to 8.30, Ridgefield's going to 8.30. So their end times of the day are closer to 3.30 at the 3.15, 3.30. So is that in half hour shift or an hour shift? They, an hour. hour. When you look at the research, you know, they, they clearly say a full hour of time is what's necessary. And that's why I'm very eager to get to Newtown to talk to them to see what they, they chose a, a, a half hour. And when we looked at our data um, and worked with Hanover Research who helped us with the survey data, um, the 30 minutes stood out much more um, you know, open to people than uh, a 60 minute, but something we have to look at. Um, did Newtown, and I just don't remember, did they flip anything or did they just adjust they adjusted and I actually have Lizzie my data <laughs> I have it all right here um, I can see if I can find Newtown Newtown um, they start at 8 and they're done at uh, 232 and what does their elementary do did she tell you that I don't have that right here, okay. but I can get that for you. Believe, Greenwich is 8.30 and they go to 3.15. But I believe Greenwich is everyone at 8.30. The whole town. And they have Everything. created that a very unique traffic, traffic issue. Traffic issue <laughs> oh. with commuters to New York yes. oh, and man. complete gridlock. Oh, yes. So oh, oh, maybe you do yes. learn from <clears throat> talking to other districts. I think, districts that, that I think some this. of the puzzle, some of the What's stuff that I think I struggle with and I think other parents so, so, so struggle so. with is it's great to look at it just from the impact of the high school, but very few people will only have kids in the high school. Mm -hmm. And so I think it has to, mm -hmm. you have to broaden the picture a little bit. So to know what these towns that have made the switch have done right. with their elementary schedule and how that kind of all and flows together. And we'll get together. all that information. I'll make sure that we have all that information. But she's been wonderful at giving me the start times and the end times, you know, of, of similar schools and right. what their periods look like. Um, uh, throughout so the day. The full bell schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah. But again, nothing's in stone. This is all exploratory. all exploratory. We're just trying to gather information. But if you have questions, by all means, I'm sure mm -hmm. Aaron will be happy to hear. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, 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 I think it's impressive that you've done as much as you have in the short period of time that you've been working on this. And I think it's great the network Aaron has formed with mm -hmm. these other districts yeah. that are taking a look at this as well. And I can Transition. tell you in my conversation with superintendents, there's many other districts watching to see what the outcome will be of yeah. the three or four districts that are in the conversation. Exactly. So. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Anyone have Thanks, any other Sarah. questions? Rupert? Isabel, any ideas? Did you do your survey? I did do my survey. <laughs> well, as someone who goes to bed late, I would say I probably get anywhere from, on average, probably only six hours to sometimes five and a half. Oh, wow. And then I have, yeah, typically two to three hours of homework. Uh, just from a student perspective, I know there are a bunch of logistics to it and a lot to work out, but I can like attest. I had a first free um, last year, and that meant me getting up an hour later than I typically did. And I always felt more refreshed, ready to go. There's always times this year where I'm like kind of out of focus and like I'm dozing off. Mm -hmm. And there might, this might be hyperbole, but none of my friends are morning people. <laughs> we'll go. It's the age. <laughs> this year I have um, AP Lit period one, Ooh. and I can say that typically half the class is tardy on any given day, and the focus is really not there. So just from a student perspective, I know there's so much that goes into it, but yeah. I would think it would be beneficial on a lot of Thank you so Thank much you for your feedback. Mm -hmm. That's very impressive, helpful. Um, Thank you very much. All right, thank you.
Um, moving on to Mr. LeClaire. Okay. 2016-17 audit report. I know that uh, uh, Not nearly we as look exciting, forward I'm sorry. to this <laughs> brief uh, report. It's only a two-page summary of um, a very comprehensive document, the Comprehensive Annual Financial uh, Report that the Town Finance Office puts uh, together every year in, work in uh, working in consultation with Bloom Shapiro, uh, the town's auditor. So we've just put uh, together just the, the, the snapshot um, exhibit for you. It was a, a, a very positive year um, overall, and um, in a, on a a general fund basis, uh, we were about $13.5 million um, on July 1st, 2016, and a little over $14.2 million uh, on uh, June 30th, 2017. Um, a little bit farther down the page, you see that there were um, there was a committed balance of 385000 and then an assigned uh, balance of of a little over 1.5 million. So that, that comes off the top of that general fund balance, leaving an unassigned general fund balance available uh, July 1st, 2017 of just over $12.2 million. Um, that committed um, reference, the 300, 385,000, that is committed to the non-lapsing account, okay? Um, and in terms of the, uh, uh, the, Board, of Edu the Board of Education, Contribution to the operating budget surplus, uh, 16250 from the public school budget and uh, 3586 uh, from the non-public school budget. Uh, flipping to the second page of the exhibit, we also look at uh, a year-over-year -year balance of our capital non-recurring uh, uh, reserve, and you see that there were more uh, expenditures than uh, revenues, so we're down to about $735,000 there. Um, so the uh, auditing firm issues a management letter. They had a, uh, an opportunity to present to the Board of Finance last last week and summarize things. Definitely a very clean management um, letter, uh, audit comments, and in terms of the uh, the two that that mention the Board of Ed and the and the town is is part of each of these. These are. Um, follow-up comments that we're, they'd still like like us to uh, keep working on an accounting procedures manual for all of the um, um, processes within the financial functions and so the town and Board of Education are keeping working on that pro uh, project and then a fraud risk assessment has uh, been recommended by Bloom uh, Shap uh, Shapiro for the town and Board of Education and that is something that uh, there was funding in uh, this current year, 1718 capital budget for uh, for this and and some other financial uh, security items. So we'll be working with the town of Simsbury to uh, to hire a firm to come in and do some sort of uh, fraud risk assessment. Um, and I just want to, as I as I always try to 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 do, is to give um, my thanks to the board of ed accountant Kira Sheehan in uh, my office because we we all joke about how budget season seems to go so so long we're starting one budget ending ending the other well the audit season is, is a bit like that also um, the auditors come in do uh, preliminary work in in May and then come back and do their field work in October November but the actual audit doesn't get issued until December or in this case late January and Kira is constantly interfacing, giving them uh, data, and just does an, an uh, excellent job. So I just want to give her my thanks. We all want to thank her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please tell her tomorrow when you see her. I will do that. that. We are very thankful for all the work she does and appreciate all having the numbers in place when we need them. Um, anyone have any questions? Well, yeah, you had mentioned two things that uh, the auditors want us to work on, and one is we probably get a consultant to do a report on fraud. Uh, that accounting assessment. procedure manual, as I recall, that, that was same recommendation was made last year as well. Correct. And possibly the year before that. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and so and so this and, is and so right. I'm wondering is are we are we going to have to finally buckle down and do that, or can we hire somebody to do it for us? So, yeah. In terms of the of this accounting procedures manual, I wish I could characterize the way the auditor uh, talked about it last week at the Board of Finance. I mean, this is the this is the ideal that they'd like to see so that if somebody leaves, you have this manual on the shelf to kind of come in and see whatever, you know, what each detailed 
uh, procedure is. I know that from our payroll team, they have made a lot of progress in um, putting together uh, procedures that were never written down mm -hmm. over the past year uh, as we've had a, a change in, in uh, uh, staffing there. So it is sort of a continual work in, in progress. Progress is being made. They are not okay. upset that it's not, that there's not this final product. They're, they're saying this is a really good thing to keep you know, Continue to, keep to make progress. On. Yes. Fair enough. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Thank you very much. While, we, while we're talking about budget and our season, I just want to go over our dates that we, um, they're all on the front page of your books that you have at home. But so March 13th is our Board of Education budget presentation to the Board of Finance. And that will be at 6 p.m. downstairs in the main, main room. <laughs> April 5th will be the Board of Finance public hearing on the capital and operation, operating budgets at 6 p.m. at the SHS Amphitheater. April 24th will be the Board of Finance final public hearing um, at 5.45 at the Town Hall. And May 15th, the budget referendum will be at Henry James um, for everyone in town to vote. And those are still tentative, but that is the intended uh, schedule. As we that, get closer, that, uh, I figure they're closer to be in that, line. But that the Board of Finance is still, is still you know, they looking could change, to, but yes, as could, far as right it, now, as we do change. have these mm -hmm. things in, yep. in sites. The 13th is for sure. <laughs> 13th is for sure. Um, okay. We have public audience available to us again. Anyone have anything they want to share? Chris, it's nice to see you. Um, we will be heading into executive session to discuss uh, evaluation of our superintendent. And so this meeting will be moving, and we will um, see us at uh, downstairs March 13th for anyone watching. We're up one against Windsor with 40 seconds left. We move that we go into executive session. Yeah. Thank you. Are you Second. Me? <laughs> Sorry. Any All those in favor? Aye. 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 Is that girls? We're moving into executive session.